everything changed It's getting harder to recognize The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I was washed from the inside I've been washed from the inside out creation 
today and even throughout our week that we would love you from the inside out that we would glorify you from the inside out may we not be hype chasers but Jesus chasers may we pursue righteousness from the inside out from the inside out God, continue to have your way in this place and in our hearts as we move into a time of hearing the word. May we leave here changed, not the same as when we walked in. We love you. All of this is for you. In your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Church, I'm so glad you're here this morning that we have the opportunity and the freedom to worship together and hear the word. And if this is your first time with us, I wanna extend a special welcome to you. We're glad that you're here and I wanna personally invite you to check out our new here, Start Here Lounge on your way out. We are a church that believes in community that you should not be doing life alone. And we have a next step for you. So whether you stop at our lounge out there or you text new to 21999, we'd love to give you your next step of how you can get connected and find your people here at Cornerstone. 
And church, I just want to say thank you so much. You continually blow me away with your generosity. It is because of you that we can keep doing what God has asked us to do in this season. So thank you so much. And if you're in the room today and you want to start being a part of our weekly giving, you can do so by texting GIVE to 21999. In just a few moments, our friend and guest speaker for today, Pastor Ron Merrill, is going to take the platform. And let me tell you, he has got an amazing word for you. I am so pumped for you to hear it. But before he comes out, I just want to take an opportunity to hype up our kids and student ministries. They have had a whole month of camps. And we've had over a thousand kids and students participating in each one of our camps this June. And it has been amazing to see what God has been doing. We've had so many first time salvations. It is amazing. God is working in our kids and our students. Man. I'm so glad that we get to be here for such a time as this. And I wanna say thank you to every parent and every volunteer that helped make those camps possible. You guys are amazing. And I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna stop talking about it and give you a moment to see what actually took place during those camps. Seven hundred and seventeen kids had a blast at Kids Camp. Two hundred and twenty said yes to Jesus. Junior high summer camp. Thirty-eight students were baptized. Twenty-three first-time salvations. Sixty-two rededicated their lives to Jesus. At high school camp, eight students were baptized. 12 answered a call to ministry. And seven students said yes to Jesus for the first time. Thirty-one high school students rededicated their lives to Jesus. a distinct opportunity for individuals, both men and women, to engage with peers who are at a more advanced stage in their spiritual faith journey. Over the course of one year, participants will have consistent meetings with their mentors to engage in scripture, assess their spiritual progress, explore pertinent subjects, and engage in joint prayer. If you're seeking accountability, inspiration, and a deeper connection with God, message MENTOR to 21999 to initiate the connection process. Cornerstone, uh, thanks so much. Uh, it's such a such a joy to be here. Um, apologies, I've got a little bit of a cold, so if I cough something up halfway through, then uh, please forgive me. Um, we're continuing in this series called Why Church that Pastor Lynn started last week, which if you did not get a chance to uh, take in and go back and watch it, it was so important and so powerful and so special as we just kind of come around what it is that God really had in mind for the church. Like you guys, Jesus had hopes for the church. He's still hoping for the church and contending for the church. And Pastor Lynn just really kicked it off strongly by calling our attention to the reality that the heart of Jesus for the church was way more than just attending something, right? just gathering once a week, that the church is not just about a building, it's not just about a program, it's not just about a location, but rather the church is a people who, way more than it's a place where. 
You know what I'm talking about? This is the expression of the body of Christ right here. And as followers of Jesus, when we, when we gather as the church, this is really special. But when we leave here, it can also be special. And the church is, is so much more than just when we gather right here. Pastor Lynn talked a little bit last week about kind of making a move from just attending to becoming. The ministers that Jesus has created us all to be, every single one of you, you've got a relationship with Jesus, then you're, you're in your own right, you're a minister of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is. And so when I listened to it, I was deeply encouraged and I was also blessed just because like 20 years ago, I was actually on staff here at Cornerstone and Pastor Lynn has had, had such a huge part in my journey that God used my time here uh, under Pastor Lynn to be a blessing to me. And so to watch the work of God through his people decade after decade after decade, it's such a gift and such a blessing. And so I'm just super thankful to, to be here. Now we live in uh, Indianapolis. Um, we made the move, my family and I, we made the move uh, two years ago to Indy, and it's been great. We really felt like the Lord was calling us there. Um, we love it. I'm not sure if you're real familiar, but there's a color called green, and, and the, it's all over Indiana. For, as a California kid and an Arizona guy, like I, was not, I didn't know the color existed. And now we're surrounded by it constantly, and it's a, it's a really, really special place. But when we made the move a couple of years ago, uh, I got three kids. My oldest were going into their sophomore and junior year of high school. That's a hard time to move. It's hard if you just moved uh, across town at that stage. But to make a move across country, it's extra hard. And so they were right in the middle of just what's already difficult being a teenager. And then to have to move cross country and be processing questions like, who am I? Where do I fit? Who are my people? I had gone through that when I was in high school. My wife had gone through that. She moved right before she started junior high. And if you've ever experienced that, you know how hard that can be to make a move in a season of life where you're already wrestling. It's already difficult just that stage of life. But then on top of it to be the new kid while you're processing your identity and while you're processing where you fit and who are my people gonna be, it's extra challenging. But those questions aren't just reserved for, for students or teenagers, are they? There are tons of adults. There's probably many of you here that are wrestling with where do I fit or who are my people or who am I really? It might be questions of identity. It might be questions of where do I belong? Maybe it has to do with the church. Maybe it has to do with work. Maybe it has to do with just friendships in general. Maybe it's dynamics going on in your family. Maybe you're just wrestling for some reason or another with who you really are and it's kind of deep down inside. You can't put a finger on it right now but there's some sort of internal wrestling match. As we have a conversation about the church and why church, well, there's a ton of reasons why Jesus chose to use the church to spread the gospel. We live in a unique moment in history where we now are God's choice to be the representation of Jesus to a watching world. That's me and you. But one of the reasons why church is such a gift and why it's such a blessing is that church provides an opportunity to discover yourself and your place. I mean, discover who you really are from God's perspective and to discover where you fit where you belong in the context of a, a body of other followers of Jesus. And once we grab a hold of that opportunity, we're really grabbing a hold of God's heart for the church. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Romans. If you're not real familiar, it's closer to the back of your Bible. You can go to the back and work to the left. You'll find this letter that Paul wrote to believers in Rome. 
and go to Romans chapter 12. Now, just quick side note, Romans chapter 12 is one of the richest, most powerful and practical chapters, maybe in all of the Bible. At the beginning of Romans 12, Paul's talked about the reality that to be a follower of Jesus is to live a life of worship. That worship is not just singing songs, but we were meant to worship God. Yes, when we gather together like we just did, but also we, we, we express our love to God as we worship him at work and we worship him as a family at home. We worship him in different ways in our neighborhoods, in the marketplace, And then he starts to unpack what a life of worship actually looks like and what the people of God, the church, would would look like. And it gets started, this passage we're going to look at here. Look at verse 3. Paul says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. It's a good start, a good warning, that's a good word. But now in the next couple of verses, listen for how he describes me and you, the church. Listen for these descriptors that will clue you and I in so clearly That God's idea, his heart, his hope for the church was so much more than simply attending a a weekly gathering. That God's heart for the church is so much more than just occupying a purple chair one hour a week. Listen to this description, verse four. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And so right here, from the heart of God, we we, we get this picture of the church as the body of Christ. We are, in fact, a tangible representation of what Jesus would sound like and behave like in our particular moment in history, in this particular location, we're the body of Christ. And just like our bodies have a whole bunch of different parts, we we make up the body of Christ with Jesus is the head. We are all these different parts that make up his body representing him and every part is needed. You guys, every single one of you is needed in the church. Every single one of you as a part is necessary in this particular local expression of the body of Christ at Cornerstone. And we all belong to each other. That that implies a real depth of relationship. And he says we've all got different gifts. We've all been given different gifts. You've got some gifts that I don't have and your gifts and my gifts together are all really needed and necessary to kind of flesh out Jesus in our community and even right here in our own church. We've got different gifts, we're not all the same, but we are one, we're unified. At least that's God's hope for us as a church. And so together when we come in on all of this, it's easy for us to see where the the, the church then is his body expressed in its best possible way. When I started thinking about the body of Christ, I started thinking about body parts in general, I I actually started thinking about Mr. Potato Head. Remember Mr. Potato Head? He's a lot smaller than I remember him. But maybe maybe because I was small the last time I had a Mr. Potato Head. Which, by the way, you can purchase Mr. Potato Head for $6.88 at your local Walmart. (laughs) Mrs. Potato Head was only $5. 
So even there in potato head world, no equality between the Mr. and the Mrs. This is still a problem. It's a problem everywhere. So we've got Mr. Potato Head. And I started thinking about it because you've got all these different parts. Now, it's, it's not always easy, right, to be a part of a body. It's not always easy because we, we don't necessarily know like where we fit. What part am I? Am I the, the eyes? I don't know. Am I the big red thing of the church? I don't know, I guess so. We, we don't always know what part we are or we, we don't know how we're to function. We might know we are a hand or we're the arm within the body of Christ, but we, we don't really know what that means. How, how do I be the hand of Jesus in the church? How do I be the arm in the body? What does that mean? What does that look like? It's challenging. Or sometimes you go, well, I know who I am. I'm an ear. But I don't like the mouth. The mouth in my church is always saying hurtful stuff. Or the earlobe, I don't know. She's always acting kind of funny. Or the feet, they're always getting into everybody else's business. And the temptation then is, if we don't know where we fit or how to function in the role that we fit in, or we get irritated and annoyed by the other body parts, the temptation is to detach ourselves from the body. And we're seeing this in huge scales because it's not easy to be a part of the body, but I guarantee you it's better. But if you pull away and detach as an arm, then like, what's the point? There is no context for you. That's why he's given us the body. We really only come to understand who we are and how to best use our gifting our function in the context of a body. And there's nothing the enemy would love more than for you to not know what part you are. There's nothing the enemy would like to do more than to say, okay, well, you know what part you are. You're an arm, but you're just limp and you're not functioning. You don't do anything. You're just hanging out, quite literally. Or best case scenario from the enemy's perspective is uh, it's too difficult, it's too annoying, I'm gonna detach entirely. And when we do that, we can get into some significant trouble because the church is the place that provides an opportunity to discover who you really are and your actual place. But both of those require something called self-awareness. It takes self-awareness to begin to discover who you are and how you're wired. It takes self-awareness to know your gifting and where you fit and belong. Self-awareness is really difficult to develop alone. It typically takes other people to help you become more self-aware. And that's one of the blessings of the church is that he's provided himself. God wants to be a part of revealing to you who you are, what part you play, and what strengths you have, and what weaknesses you have, and what blind spots you have. And he wants to frame you up in the context of what's really true about you and where you do fit. And he wants his voice to be louder than the enemy's. But he also wants to give me and you some friends, some brothers and sisters in Christ that can speak into, gosh, I see some real talent here. I see some spiritual gifting here. Or it's difficult, but he wants to give us some safe people in our lives that graciously come alongside and say, hey, you've got a real blind spot here. And if this is left undealt with, it's really gonna harm you over the long haul. 
You have a friend or a family member that's like the least self-aware person ever? How many of you have that? Yeah, okay, not the person next to you, I get it, but we've all got them, right? And they create this kind of false front, forever refusing to acknowledge like who they really are. They live in a constant state of denial, constant excuses. They never invite anybody's opinions in, never invite any counsel, never seek any help or assistance. They live a very isolated sort of existence. The problem is the more isolated that we are, the more likely we are to stay unaware of our weaknesses, our blind spots, even our strengths. But the more in community we are, the more in fellowship, the more that we invite others and the Lord into the deepest parts of us and into our day-to-day, the more we will be able to discover who we really are and where we fit and where we belong. See, the church is so rich. It's so much more exciting to be a part of the depth of church that Jesus hoped for than just attending a service from time to time. I, I, I think that's probably why in Romans chapter 12, verse three, Paul started with this particular warning because Romans chapter three started with a warning that was really about self-awareness. Did you catch it? Here was the warning, don't think you are better than you really are. That's an invitation, that's a call toward, hey, be aware of pride or arrogance in your life. And then he says, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. That's assuming that you do evaluate yourself from time to time. You think below the surface, not just about behavior, but like what's really going on with me? Who am I really? Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And so the tool that God has given me and you to help us understand ourselves, the the ruler, the measuring stick for me and you, it's the gospel. It's the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for me and you. See, when it comes to learning who you really are, I think it's gotta start with the gospel. The gospel always speaks a better word. It's always gonna meet you right where you're at. And as the church, we're gospel people. We're centered around the gospel. We're rescued because of who Jesus is. So we've got the gospel and we are gospel people. And the gospel helps me stay out of two dishes that I'm prone to fall into. Every single one of us are prone to fall into one of two ditches. It could depend on the week. Some of you may fall into this one more than the other one, but at least this is my journey between me and me. The ditches that you and I can fall into, that I find myself falling into, one is I think more highly of myself than I ought. I think the world revolves around me. Now this is often subconscious, but I can get pulled into this. And this is where pride and arrogance lives. It's all about me. And when we live that way, We we need someone else to come alongside and pop the bubble. This is the Mary Poppins syndrome. This is the I'm practically perfect in every single way. Thank you very much. You can thank me later. It's all about me. And we kind of elevate ourselves really to God's level at this point. We think of ourselves too highly. But then the other ditch that I fall into is kind of the opposite, and that is probably more like the Eeyore syndrome, and I think too low of myself. That sounds something like, I'm a mess, I'm a failure, I'm a loser, and I always will be. So it's not this pride and arrogance thing up here, it's this, gosh, I, I think so poorly of myself all the time. And what the gospel says and what gospel people say, it has the ability to do two things simultaneously often. 
One is to encourage those of us that feel horrible about ourselves all the time. The gospel will lift you up to a healthy understanding of who you really are. It'll remind you that your identity's not in your performance. Your identity isn't tied to your failures. Your identity, who you really are, is tied to Jesus and what he's done for you and what he says about you. And that'll pick the lowest of us up to an accurate understanding of me. The gospel can also humble those of us that are riding on the pride pride cloud. And when we need to come down out of the clouds, the gospel will humble us in a way that's appropriate and say, hey, you're not God, and this whole thing is not about me. See, depending on the day or the week or how we're wired, we need the gospel to come to a solid understanding of who we are. We need a gospel understanding to to begin any sort of self-awareness And it's this journey of of discovery, who we really are and where we fit and belong that can take place in the context of of the church. Kind of practically, I'd love just to give three things to kind of wrap this up. Three areas of life that that if you put before yourself often, if you put these before God often, and if you put these before a trusted friend or family member often, as areas of evaluation, it'll really help. It'll really help you truly know who you are, it'll help you know where you fit and where you belong, and and it'll make a more robust experience with you in the body of Christ. And so I'm gonna give these three areas. Each of them have a question that you should ask. And then I want you to be thinking about those three groups of people. You are gonna ask yourself the question. You're gonna invite God into the question. And then I want you to be thinking about an individual. I would prefer that it wouldn't be your spouse if you're married. You've got a trusted brother and sister in Christ, a trusted friend, a safe person that you can invite them into the question as well. Hey, do you see this in me? Or ask me this question occasionally, okay? And that threefold thing of some other person in the church and God and you processing it, I think will kind of bring to the surface some of the stuff that needs to be brought to the surface, whether it is strengths or weaknesses, all all, all for, for God's glory. So the first area, I would say do a heart check. Do a heart check. And here's the question that would go along with that. How am I really doing on the inside? How am I really doing on the inside? Take a moment, just a brief moment, and ask yourself that question right now. I'm not talking about behavior. I'm not talking about your struggles. I'm talking about how is your heart doing today? Some of you might go, I don't know. Some of you go, oh, you know what? I know exactly how my heart's doing. It's not doing good at all. I've got a hard heart, if I'm honest. Or I've got a broken heart. Or I'm feeling half-hearted or my heart is troubled, or it depends on today, might be different than tomorrow. The deal is with the heart is that as your heart is there, the rest of you will go. You got a hard heart, then it's gonna show up in your behavior, it's gonna show up in your words. You've got a soft, tender heart, it's gonna show up in your words, it's gonna show up in your behaviors. You got a broken heart, it's gonna show up in your words, it's gonna show up in your behavior. The heart is really at the core of you. Pastor Lynn talked about this last week, looking at the brokenness in our world, and in our country, and the brokenness that we see, the brokenness of politics, the brokenness of poverty, the brokenness of crime, those are all just symptoms of a broken 
heart and soul spiritually. All of this is really heart issues. And so who else but the church are gonna be able to have heart level conversations? You should be putting your heart and your soul before God. Psalm 139 is one of my favorites. It's a Psalm of David's. David is kind of an icon of the faith in the Old Testament. He was king of the Israelites and it's recorded of him that he was a man after God's own heart. But if you know David's life, you know when he was on, he was really on. And when he was off, he was really off. He had the roller coaster. He had to process what his heart was like on a regular basis. And he wrote this Psalm 139. And at the end of it, there's almost a prayer. And I was wondering maybe if you would make David's prayer your prayer for this week. Here's how it, here's how it ends. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Would you invite God into whatever's going on in your heart? God, test my heart. <coughs> Search my heart. Know my heart. God, I, I couldn't even make sense of my heart right now, so would you give me wisdom and discernment about what's really going on in here? I, I wanna discover who I really am, and not just by my behavior, not just by my job, not by my bank account, not by my appearance. I wanna know who I am deep down inside. So point out stuff in me that's good. Point out the stuff that's not so good, and would you deal with it? And then, as you are having that conversation between you and you, and then inviting God into it as well, then bring in that person, that trusted brother and sister in the church, who can ask you this question on a regular basis. How is your heart doing? How are you really doing on the inside? That's such a powerful question. It's a great question. I don't care if you're a a guy or a girl, if you're younger or you're older, just try every once in a while with some trusted people saying, how's your heart doing? You, you, you almost can't answer that off the cuff. Well, it's fine. You know, you, it forces you to stop. And if you really want to start a journey of who you are and a, certainly a journey of self-awareness, it's got to start way down deep in your heart and in your soul. And that's something the church is particularly suited for. Do a heart check on a regular basis. Then second, do a relational check. Do the heart check, but then do a relational check and ask a question something like this. Am I growing closer to or building up others around me? Just ask yourself that right now. Do I seem to be in this last season, whatever it is, couple weeks, couple months, couple years, Am I growing closer and closer to the people around me or am I kind of isolating? Am I growing further apart? Am I building others up? Am I intentional about that? The mentoring, the discipleship? Am I being built up? I believe that every one of us should be in a relationship that we've got a peer level. I believe every one of us should have a safe peer level relationship where we can be open and honest about everything. I also believe we should all have a relationship where someone older or wiser than us is pouring into us. And I believe all of us should be pouring down into someone else in, in the church. So find a place to serve, find that small group, find that small church to get invested relationally like Pastor Lynn was talking about last week where you can know people and be known. I was at a church in Los Angeles for a while. It was a large church, and, and this was years and years ago. They, they had a 300-person choir and orchestra, and that was the worship every single week. And so it was itself a small church in the context of this larger church, and the relationships in the choir and orchestra people was nuts. 
These people were crazy, just loving each other the way that Jesus calls us to love the church. One of their kids would be in trouble and dozens of them would go over and help. Some of them are in financial trouble and dozens of them would be to help. At one point while I was there, somebody in the orchestra uh, was gonna die if they didn't get a kidney transplant and another musician said, I'll give you my kidney so that you can live and then they did. That's what the church should be. That relationship that is so authentic and so safe and so real, this is some of God's heart for us in the church to be growing closer, not further apart, to be building into other people and being built into by other people. This is God's heart for the church. So if you're looking for who you are and where your place is, do the evaluation on a regular basis of this this relational check, heart check, relationship, And then third check, do a talent check, a talent check. Ask yourself the question, something like, am I stewarding the gifts, the talents, the abilities that the Lord has given me well? God's given every single one of you some amazing gifts and talents and abilities. If you got a relationship with God through Jesus, then he has gifted you supernaturally, I might add. You've got a superpower to be put to use for the kingdom of God. It might be put to use in the context of ministries that take place on campus or out in the community or at home or at work, but he's given you gifts. You've been placed here to do something on this planet that no one else can do. So go discover what gift he has given you, what talents and skills and abilities he's given you. Do you even know what they are? Once you discover them, then you go put them to use. You don't have to get a master's degree in it. You don't have to wait a decade. Just go start using it. And then as you do, it will grow it. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter four, It says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then, look, everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. So you've got these amazing gifts and talents and abilities that he's so desiring to use. Are you stewarding those well? Or are you the arm that's just limp on the body? Are you the foot that the rest of the body is just dragging along? Are you an ear that's just completely detached? That's not God's best, it's not God's heart for the church. When I was 15 years old is when I got saved. We moved to a new town and we started to go to church. I got involved in the youth group there. And I started to hear about Jesus and the gospel through my youth pastor, his name was Eddie. And he just overwhelmingly loved me to Christ. It made a massive difference. Suddenly a part of this church family And then Jesus spoke into the deepest parts of me, my real identity, and it was life-changing. And like three months after I became a Christian, Eddie came and said, hey, Ron, I need you to start teaching junior high Sunday school on Sunday mornings. I went, what? That does not sound like a good idea, Eddie. One, like junior hires are gonna eat me alive and I'm not that much older than them. And two, I said, Eddie, I just became a Christian. I I don't know how to teach. I don't know anything about the Bible. I said, Eddie, we were just playing some silly Bible trivia game last week and you asked a question about Abraham. I thought you were talking about Lincoln. I don't know what you're talking about. How am I gonna teach these, these students? And he said, it's okay, don't worry about it. You and I will meet every single Wednesday 
do the Bible study together, plan the message together, and then you'll go teach it to those kids on the following Sunday. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. I showed up that first Sunday. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> it, was, it was so horrible. I loved it, I had so much fun, but it was like Lord of the Flies in there. It was so wild. And then they asked me questions that I didn't know the answer to. But thankfully, Eddie had already covered this. He said, Ron, if you get asked a question that you don't know the answer to, here's what you tell them. This is always appropriate. Just say, I don't know, but I will go find out and I'll tell you next week. That's always a good answer. And over the course of that year of being discipled in the word by Eddie, having the opportunity to put my gifts into practice on a weekly basis and grow them, it changed everything for me. See, the church has been quite the blessing to me when it comes to learning who I am and where I fit and where I belong. It can be the same blessing to you if it isn't already. But at the end of the day, the church is not about me. It's not about you. What Peter said was, once we put the gifts into use, then who gets the glory? It's not me. It's Jesus. See, we are here not to make ourselves known. We are here as the local expression of the body of Christ to make much of Jesus. It's okay if you get to know yourself better and your place better, but the point of that is to make Jesus known. At home, at church, and in the marketplace. The beginning and the middle and the end is all about Jesus. And when it stops being about us, it starts becoming about him. Now we're like really leaning into the hopes that Jesus had for his church. And so in the name of almighty God, do it. Let's go be the church that he's called us to be. And so gracious heavenly father, thank you. Thank you for these precious people at Cornerstone and for those that are pouring out so often and those that are investing in others and building up others, those that are relationally looking out for others. Thank you for those who've got hearts that are positioned and postured towards you, open to you. Thank you that they're helping the rest of us along in this journey. Lord, we wanna be the church that you have called us to be more and more every month, every year. Just continue to cultivate in us a discovery, yeah, of who we really are and where we fit in the body, but don't let us forget that you're the head of this body. And the whole point of our beautiful expression of your gifting put in us is to point people to you. So would you do that more and more? Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, we love you so much. So thankful for you. If you need prayer, uh, make your way forward. We'd love to pray for you. God bless. Have a good week.